So first of all, um, very grateful to have all of you again to join us today for our last um, artist sharing session with uh, our exhibition Noble Rot. I am Kassan. I am one of the curators at Parasite. And today it's my pleasure to uh, invite three of the participating artists in uh, the part two section of the exhibition to join, join us for a conversation, uh, including Michelle, uh, Nyazi, and uh, Wing Zi. Uh, today's uh, topic will uh, revolve around a uh, discussion of nature, um, uh, voices of uh, non-human narratives, and also the power of imagery. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to start uh, our session with, you know, kind of the brief, brief introduction of the artist and also their um, exhibiting works in the show. So first and foremost, um, I would love to, uh, you know, first go with Michelle. So hello, Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. Maybe you can uh, first, you know, introduce yourself a little bit and also talk about you know, the, the work in the show. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Michelle, and I graduated in two, uh, 2020 and in a fine arts department of the CHK. And my usual practice revolves around um, installations as my attempts to negotiate uh, possibilities in uh, uh, negotiating through chaos and turmoils. And so my installations usually are some imageries or uh, imaginative uh, scenarios that I construct to help myself to search for solutions or as I said, uh, negotiate through calamities or some um, complexities that I uh, find difficult in understanding. Mm -hmm. So like uh, the set of installation that is showing right now in Parasite is actually sprang from my self-confrontation towards my approach in understanding calamities or absurdities that happened uh, to us or to the world in the recent years. Um, like in the past two years, I started So uh, seems like uh, Michelle's, uh, there are some technicality issues with Michelle's um, Zoom. So perhaps while we wait for uh, when she or is able to rejoin us, um, perhaps we can change a little bit of sequence. Uh, maybe, maybe we can uh, start you know, the session with Adi's uh, introduction and work perhaps. Uh, Ati, would you would you mind uh, you know um, jumping in for the moment and we'll wait for Michelle's turn? Sure. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi. <laughs> Hi. And I'm at Chi, and I graduated in 2019 at Hong Kong Baptist University, and my major study is photography. So most of the time I'm using photog and videos and doing our uh, installation. And at the beginning, I'm focusing on the family issues of him to study the relationship, uh, how we work, how the family working together and after after I graduated, I started to study uh, human and animals, the relationship be between us. And in the, uh, in the show at Parasite, I also 
doing my first artwork under the theme of animals. And this is about the dolphin stories. Mm -hmm. And because dolphin is my first study animals at the beginning of the whole animals project. And I saw a documentary film called The Cove. And the film is captured the mass dolphin killed in a Japanese pace. And after that, and I want to find out, or I know that a dolphin in Hong Kong is also have a significant, it have some significant in our mm -hmm. history because uh, we have a long history with dolphin that Hong Kong is the first place in the world where the artificial conception of dolphins and Chinese wise dolphin were chosen to be the mascot of the handover. So we can find many dolphin sculpture around in Hong Kong. So mm -hmm. I started to find a dolphin sculpture and decided to have some uh, field study on Long Gu Tan. Mm. Yeah. So I think in, uh, in the show, uh, your work uh, kind of, uh, you know, shows, um, you know, uh, quite a sad reality for the dolphins. Uh, so because of the very rapid urban development in Hong Kong. So perhaps you can talk a little bit more of the setup of your work, because I saw, you know, I'm sure everyone can see the photo right now. There is definitely a projection. There is a kind of a television screen laid horizontally. And also there seems to be some wall pieces as well. Would you mind uh, telling our audience a little bit of the different component components of your work for the moment? Sure. Um, there are three parts that have a set a series of photography and two videos. And the main projection is the video that I I, the, I have the field study few times on Long Gu Tan and mm. there have some process or some images video that I took in, in during that time and in the trip actually I want to buy a dolphin in Long Gu Tan because there are the uh, they're having a look out for visitor to observe the Chinese white dolphin at the sea. So mm. uh, I started to during this trip, like to find the real dolphins in Hong Kong. Uh, do they still survive in our sea or yeah, mm. try to mm. find out them. And so the video is mainly to, I use a telescope to observe the dolphin on, at the sea so you can see the video will have a circle at the center or different kind of set, circle collage in the uh, in the image, mm. on the image and after that uh, after few time field study I haven't find out the dolphins <laughs> also mm. Uh, last time I visited Long Gu Tan, the outlook, it is a signboard at, at the entrance, but the signboard is, uh, the signboard already excluded by the government, so mm -hmm. I they is already, they want to remove it or they want to remove the, this, uh, this sign. Mm. To, yeah. And after that, there have a uh, three images mm. at, at the exhibition venue, and this is the sculpture that at Long Gu Tan Chu, uh, because there have a there is a like look like a famous place to look out the dolphins, so they have mm. a sculpture on that place. So, but sculpture is already broken but no one will recover that 
So I took a few of the images about the broken sculpture. And it's like her, you can see the setup. It's like, I, I want to, I like it. It's like a conversation or mm. they have an opposite side that uh, I'm fine the real Dovin, but I just saw the fake one <laughs> and it's already yeah. broken. So it's mm. like a, a ironic situation that I want to show up in the show. Definitely. So maybe uh, audience uh, participants today, uh, we can have a, a general sense of uh, what the video content looks like. So we prepared kind of like a snippet for everyone to have a look. So as Adzi mentioned, um, she particularly used a, you know, um, circle kind of lens to really frame the video. And Adzi, I believe this is the the sea view that you saw at Longgu Tan at the beach, is it? Yes, this is the uh, sunset. <laughs> I finished the field study and find nothing. Oh. <laughs> and, just, and I just record it. And mm. it also looks like a like a results or like a yeah, like something that I find out in long time. It's nothing in the city, but it's like also like we can walk a some reflection when you're looking at the sea, the dolphin habitat already disappeared by us, mm. by a different development. In mm. What is so interesting about this video, I noticed that you kind of rotate the video 90 degrees. So yeah. we're looking at like kind of almost like a vertical of the horizon rather than the horizontal one. Um, is, is there a particular reason that you want to kind of flip the the video? Uh, actually, it is also upside down. The ah. also, so I think because the image is showing is like, I think it's like a very dramatic or mm. like, mm. yeah not very blue, so I want to show it like more like story. Ah, okay, so it's kind of creating a sense of inverted reality, isn't it? So because since your work, it's also, you know, talking about the juxtaposition of trying to see a real dolphin as an animal, but at the end of the day, the only dolphin you find is just a broken sculpture. I think that is the brutal reality of what the animals are going through in Hong Kong because of, you know, the urban development. So I think this kind of um, interesting way of, of inverting the video recording on with both ways, it, it's kind of, uh, kind of creating like a subverted um, version of reality of what we're going through. And you're literally, you know, take recording um, the habitat of where the dolphin used to live. So I think that it's quite, uh, you know, important to show, you know, our audience of how you see the relationship of, you know, dolphins living in, uh, in the habitat that humans have already destroyed pretty much. So I think that's very interesting. I would definitely, you know, we can definitely come back to this discussion, uh, you know, further in the sessions. Um, but I would love to connect this kind of idea of imagery with uh, Wing C's very interesting installation and sculpture. So um, Wing C, would you like to uh, uh, introduce a bit of your uh, practice and also, um, your work in the exhibition. Um, hi, this is Wing Si. Uh, so I've graduated from the Chinese University of Hong Kong in 2020. Um, it has been two years since I've practiced art independently without, uh, without like outside of school. So. I usually do installations and I pay attention to the tactility of materials in which I am figuring the possibility to channel 
uh, the immediacy of our experience into physical attributes of all. And mm. I'm seeking if we can be empathized by objects, if we can, we can deliver the unspoken feelings through through the through the the suffering or the or the damage that I have done onto these objects, so that we can. Um, by we, I mean um, artists and all viewers of the art can find a common ground through the piece of art. Mm. Mm. So in this, in the show, you kind of have mainly three components. I saw there is a sculpture with literally a piece of um, very thick branch poke striking through a very rough uh, metal panel. There's also another monumental sculpture that is against the wall and you covered. Um, again, another branch with uh, fabric and also uh, wool and textile. And there's also a component that you kind of, um, I believe you you know, you create those marks on the wall, and, and and I would love to, you know, if you if that would be great if you can briefly talk a little bit of the of the meaning or uh, the different components in your work. Well, uh, so there is a is a sequence in the creation of these these this this series that I started with. A, the large branch with yarn, and then I came up with the idea of the of the metal panel, and then uh, it was the the the, <laughs> the gashes that I I have done onto the wall. Mm. Well, I think that it is. It also represents how my my idea develops. That I started with an imagery of a of a giant rising from beneath the, of the ocean so that um, the large branch is called spine because the, the large branch is meant to, to imitate or to represent um, how, how, how I imagine a spine is. That is with, I, I think spine is something that supports you, that make you, makes you stand, that, um, but it is not entirely, entirely straight. Mm. I admire the strength that is stored within the spine and that I have selected the material of yarn to, to which echoes to my imagination of how the water would, would split apart when, when, the giant rise from from the sea mm. and that since I, I find myself often being unable to speak that all I have to speak with only one piece so uh, I I've often have to make a few pieces of 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 sculptures objects together and and compose an installation so that they can they can, they can like, the, among them can create a conversation. Mm. And that's why I, I then make the metal panel. Um, the metal panel, it is called puncture because uh, um, I try not to use the word because, <laughs> and, it is on, on the metal panel that I have smashed it with a hammer and I also burnt it with, with my, my gas torch. And I, I pierced through it with a, a narrower branch. Mm. I'm trying to, I, I think many of my recent artworks they're trying to 
to to to perform the kind of pain um, that is hard to to deliver through verbal text mm. Mm. and i when i'm hurting the materials it is kind of a relief because I visualize the feeling that was hidden within. Mm -hmm. I'm very, I'm also very intrigued by uh, the title of the works because for every uh, noun, you have a arrow pointing up. Yes. Um, <laughs> is there a, I, you know, what does it mean, you know, for when you include all of this, all, this symbol in all of the works? Do you have a particular meaning of, of this kind of a imagery, a symbol that you use in the title? Well, I think this arrow <laughs> pointing mm -hmm. upwards um, I, is the, is the, the name of the series of these three pieces of work. And that I, I have this arrow because of the very initial imagery that inspired me to create them is the, the, the giant in my imagination that he, this person is rising from the sea, like I mentioned. So mm -hmm. I, I guess what I've been longing for is the kind of strength that, that, were, that have been been at rest for too long that when when it rises up it, it has the power to confront or to to face everything that is that is beyond like mm. when you have been covered by by an environment in entirely in my imagery that that was the sea water and then when you when you really go into go into somewhere filled with oxygen uh, and other gases. I do not, I, I don't know their names. <laughs> so it, it, it is, it takes courage. And mm. I think this is, this is why after all those damages I've done onto the objects, there, there is, is a power leading upwards. Mm. Mm. I, th I think uh, one of the common themes between uh, all the three artists uh, is that there's a almost a attempt to uh, visualize suffering from imagery, and you know, for Wing Z's work is definitely you know your 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 uh, kind of like a dreamlike imagery of how you long for your desire for strength or kind of rising above from suffering you know, from the sea. And you kind of convert and transform that imagery into interesting narratives, you know, that is cons that consists of free installations. While uh, previously for Aziz, uh, video and uh, kind of a print works, definitely using a lot of uh, non-verbal, non-language uh, language to uh, <laughs> talk about, you know, uh, the suffering of dolphins, suffering of non-human beings. And I, I think what will be interesting for audience to you know, connect is how Michelle's work that, uh, did that. And uh, so Michelle, um, perhaps you can uh, continue kind of your um, explanation of the work in the show when Mother Nature sings her lullaby. Sure, sorry for the discussion. Uh... So uh, when talking about suffering, I think my kind of suffering in, in the installation work is um, peers in a quiet, quietly and restless way that is, um, that is not dramatic or, or uh, exciting, but in quite a daily and mundane way that is perhaps involves the repeating of routines or uh, some 
uh, unexplainable irrationalities in our daily lives that are shown in the in the clips in one of the videos that is in a portrait that is shown in the portrait way mm. um so i tried to link up the seemingly random and seemingly unconnected or unrelatable clips using a way that is a perspective that keeps zooming out and once a video is finished a clip is finished another clip emerges from one of the corners in that videos and it creates sort of a, a loop perhaps or mm. sort of some interconnections between those videos uh, mm. that I think are representing my concern over over the very plain suffering in our mundane life and of course about the contemporary um, uh, unspoken or uh, often neglectable uh, times. Mm. So perhaps from this particular installation view, we can see most of the components and elements in your work. There are definitely a few video projection or screens going on. There's kind of like a sculpture that is made of oyster shell. You have um, a sculpture that's made of kind of a metal wire net. And there are definitely some indiscernible objects on the floor. Um, I think what would be interesting is uh, why why would you uh, you know kind of want to kind of a uh, create a work that has so many different elements, but you you seem to be talking like uh, you know a, a a certain kind of undescribable feeling or undescribable uh, negative feeling or or suffering because uh, usually you know for example like Wing Z's work if you can see there is a kind of more cohesive way to present the suffering there's you know the definitely the the branches and um you know this the violence in it but it seems like in your work is more dispersed i would like to know more about that from your point of view um i think that is also relatable to my usual practice mm. of uh creating uh imaginary scenarios but, mm. but of course, like, uh, let me jump back to uh, about the chaos and turmoils I was talking in my works. Mm. Um, the way that I display my components or, uh, for example, videos or sculptures or objects uh, in my sets are often in a scattered or uh, shattered way like you mentioned and also mm. um, the videos clips they are also arranged or um, presented in a montage or fragmented way mm. i think that sort of relates to how uh how my worldview is like uh the the sort of fragmented and uh, chaotic way things are are presented together in a space seemingly uh, random or uh, irrelatable to each other but actually uh, mm. they are interconnected or interwoven under the same span of a uh, very wide or mm. broad nets, I would say. Mm -hmm. Well, that's actually what I was uh, about to say, because it seems like for Michelle's work, you have a more fragmented approach in terms of memory and feeling. It's what we usually call a little bit postmodern kind of way to interpret uh, imageries. But I think like if you compare Michelle's work with Wing Z's 
installation, Wing Z's way of approach has a much more um, coherent kind of direction. It's, it's less of a less dispersed approach to memory and feelings. So I want to, uh, you know, continue the conversation with Michelle, especially um, the sculptures that you made, uh, because I, it's, I would love to learn why you want to use oyster shells to make the sculpture. Like what's the meaning of an oyster shell and you know, how do you connect this work with uh, the, the videos that are playing in your space? Um, uh, my initial idea uh, of this installation was to create um, a refuge space that happens to, or take place in the contemporary setting where we are situated in. Mm -hmm. And when I was uh, researching about um, refuge in in the present or in the past, um, you know there are different kinds of uh, refuge. For example, I also deem hermits as a kind of refuge, like they take refuge in the nature to um, afford or uh, to escape from, from political scenarios or political environments that they despise. And so uh, one of the research results that I found out was about um, the low thing, low thing, uh, <laughs> the, 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 uh, the, mythology or of yeah of the being the the low thing yeah the kind of fictional animal slash human right being. that 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 originated that was uh set originated from uh the uh, uh area near the pro uh delta Harbor. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so kind of uh, near um, also where China and Macau is. So it's kind right. of the triangular relationship, you know, in terms of geography. Right. Mm. And like, I, I found out that uh, something interesting about the history, it, that their maybe fictional history is also that they were escaping from um from the government officials or uh they were they were actually uh descendants of uh rebellions and after they escaped it to the islands near those areas they 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 were set as half human half fish and they um, make a living by uh, fishing and catching and trading oysters and fish and the amount of oysters they they catched they caught or they traded were so much so many that uh, they used the oyster shells to build their walls mm. and I was very intrigued by the action of using oyster shells to build up their own walls, their own like shields. And mm. so um, if I was to create uh, um, another refuge space of my own or of, or of my own imagination for this time and place, I would in certainly involve that kind of oyster shell wall. Mm. So I think that's an interesting approach to involve mythology or kind of what we say fictional history, uh, but also very you know symbolic with contemporary issues in in conversation with you know works that are about memory and suffering. Um, I would like to kind of continue that kind of discussion back to uh, 
Ngazi's uh, work. So one of the questions as that I, you know, as a curator that I, I always ask myself how to, um, um, you know, understand works that are heavily related with animals, because I think there is a general assumption that because animals and humans, we don't speak the same language, it's almost impossible to understand what they think, what they're going through, uh, not to mention to understand their suffering or their feeling. So for you as an artist, um, how do you approach, you know, animals and how do you approach, you know, understand, what is your approach to understand uh, animals despite, uh, you know, without a common language? I think I, most of the time I will do a lot of research to see the history, how we collapse or how the animals develop from the part to now. Mm. And, and I, I don't like to make the work very, just like, uh, I want to protect the animals or mm. I don't want to make the work like this. But so I try to use a like a fiction or some field study history background to uh, creating some of the scenario or some of the story that I want to tell or, and I don't want to focus in a lot on how we want to uh, feel pretty on the animals but I think we need to just like think about how we can living together in the same place not we just have a lot of development but they because they can they can't tell us that how they lost a lot of their places but um i think we can through the work or how we expressing that uh, think about or um think about the history or the background, how we living together before and how we can develop a more uh, better uh, mm. policy or environment that we can live together. I think uh, that's, that, that's always the, the power of what we, what academic, Academia used to say as you know animal studies, but in a cultural uh, approach. So I think you know by understanding or trying to understand animals, it's always you know able to be a powerful um, methodology to reflect on human behaviors, the human ideologies. I think a lot of times you know from from the zoo to aquariums to how we treat animals in um you know laboratories and in nature i think it's a you know it the suffering of animals represent our own ideologies and actions in unfortunately a very you know painful way and um and and it seems like you know in order to understand our own behaviors, uh, but not through a linguistic a verbal communication with the animals. You know, we cannot just, you know, have a mic and they say, you know, hey dolphin, you know, what are you going through in the sea? But you know, because of our urban development. So we always need to go back with imagery. So we always need to use nonverbal language to in order to understand what they're going through. And I find uh, you know, Aziz's um, approach with animals quite important because we cannot just automatically assume animals as mm, a being that needs our sympathy. I think we need to have a more em empathetic, empathetic approach 
uh, with our you know human animal relationship it's it's to really see them not that different from us you know the uh, I, I believe we can still understand animals without language because you know our pets uh, I'm sure we're able to understand whether they are uh, healthy or not you know by looking at their behaviors uh, to, if they're you know kind of have a strange uh, a habit or a strange behavior. So I think we can always apply that relationship with pets to wild animals, so to say, animals that are outside of households. And um, I, I find it quite interesting that you choose dolphin as the subject matter rather than a, a cat or a dog or some other kind of animals. And my own interpretation is, besides your own research interest, of course, is dolphins are actually highly intelligent animals and they're able to communicate in various ways. You know, they, they, you know, they, they're able to hunt together. They're able to, you know, understand complex um, ideas and they're actually very, very playful as well. And um, I, I definitely want to know a little bit more the process when you're doing the research is, um, uh, you know, before and after your research, do you have a, a new understanding of dolphins or any you know, interesting ideas that you actually didn't know before the research? Um, before I, because, because I have been working in a theme park before, so I visit the dolphin in a pool and after a few time I visiting them, some of the dolphin will recognize you. So mm. if it's, uh, their eyes will be looking at you for a long time. So uh, I just, you can know that they can recognize you. And after that, I do some of the research or seeing some documentary and they showed a lot of um, some researchers talk about the uh, the scholars study their behavior, how they um, how they hunting the food, or and there have had some case that uh, there a uh, dolphin called Fipper, and this is uh, the first television dolphin show in a TV in US and the dolphins called Kathy and the real dolphins is called Kathy and after he performed he just uh, suicide and mm -hmm. it just uh, don't breathe by itself so he just it, it just uh, the dolphin can feel or they have the feelings that he it won't uh, he won't he don't want to do that so mm -hmm. he choose to suicide so this behavior or other animals will also have different uh, stereotypic behavior that they will have uh, always repeating to walk around and this is like a, a illness for them. It's also like our emotional problem when we feel upset or feel pressure. So mm. what I'm studying is about, uh, I'm just thinking we just like share the same experience of, um, and I want to find out the similarity between us Mm. and animals and how it's similar or how the analogic relationship we have been built from the past and now mm. so that's the direction that I study for I completely agree with you I think uh art um you know studying animals the first and foremost really help us to understand the binary between human and non-human beings are actually 
not, you know, this kind of binary or hierarchy can easily be deconstructed, especially when, you know, as Anji mentioned, like the dolphin in the theme park actually commit suicide and this very almost humanistic behavior of how they approach emotions and suffering and mental health it's it's uncanny it's very uncanny it's 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 almost remind ourselves that you know we do have a common language it's just, just that we avoid to accept that reality and uh the second thing is I I think it it really helps us to have a better position, uh, you know, between human and nature. I think it's a, uh, you know, global warming or environmental issues, environmental debates have always, you know, been here for some time, but it seems like it's always difficult for people to really take action with it. We we'll always talk about it. We know global warming is happening. We know the ice cape, ice caps are melting, but it seems very difficult for us to really see the reality and feel like it's a very important issue to not only to discuss on, but also to take actions. And I think one of the best ways to really allowing ourselves to take action is to understand animals. And what is more important is to understand why there is a fine line between pets and wild animals. And perhaps if uh, we, we shouldn't use English word to think about it, maybe we use even German language because you know animals in, um, in the wild is called tier, but then pets are called house tier, which is house animals. So why, you know, household it's become such an important separation between to define what kind of animals are humanistic or what animals that we shouldn't kill, but the others we're able to just make them suffer. And, you know, as Aji mentions, there is a dolphin massacre in Japan every year as the festival or, you know, a ritual. So, so why do we draw the line like that and how, or how can we understand and you know, overthrow such uh, uh, unfair hierarchy and exploitation to animals. And I think that's something that Aji's work can really make us to uh, ponder. So thank you so much for having such an incredible work in the show. And I do want to, you know, kind of uh, expand the idea of suffering with Wing Z's uh, installation. So I want to get back to, um, you talk, the, you talk a lot about the, the two, you know, sculptures with the branches, but I would love to actually learn a little bit more of the gashes though. So it's because uh, you, and you created these slash, you know, by yourself when, during the installation. And uh, when you do all these motions, it's actually quite violent. And you, when you do it yourself, you know, what what was actually going through your mind when you're creating all these marks on the wall? Well, I, I would like to first of all, I would like to show my gratitude to Parasite allowing me to to damage <laughs> their wall. <laughs> I spent a day at the venue to like I bought a I bought an an axe from from the metalware shop and then I took the took the the axe to to Parasite and started smashing their walls. <laughs> yeah, so I'm very thankful. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I have this impulse of, of I, I guess I, I just I just hate being polite or being being like theatrical with with my installations. But mm -hmm. I, I think my my work should be authentic. That when I'm creating this this gestures of anger that I'm I should be really making it fast and uh, making it violently and uh, and this is why I, I'm trying to 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 do this work the gashes that I I I'm giving my myself an opportunity of an 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 emotional outbreak or mm. or to say an exit to my my feelings that ha have been stored within for too long. Mm. Mm. 
Mm. Um, Kasan, do you have a close up of a, of a piece of work? I do have a few, uh, maybe, maybe from this angle for the moment. Huh. Okay, so I poured uh, epoxy resin into the into the gashes <laughs> and let it drop onto the ground naturally, thanks to parasite again, letting me make the make the floor dirty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess I'm trying to to trying to receive some feedback from the wall. But I, mm. I'm also imagining, um, mm. well, because if, if I, I'm getting no feedback from the wall, that is, that is sad when, you, when you've done something upon an object and uh, the, the object does not respond to you. So I guess when I, I, I kind of, when I'm hurting it, I, there should be some reactions from the wall as well. I, sh mm. I should. Again, I, I'm thinking that the paint should be visualized so that it is, it is um, like uh, juices are, are being squeezed out from, from the wall when I, when I smash it. Mm. I, what I find it so powerful of your work is, uh, you know, it, I'm sure when everyone see this kind of gashes, you know, it's a very violent imagery. It's a very violent visual. And these kind of epoxy, it, you know, it's just like very like black blood oozing out of, you know, wounds. And it, it creates a very uh, uncomfortable feeling for everyone. But what I, what I uh, find it very powerful is that this is a very personal work from you because you really uh, transform your, I guess, internalized suffering and pain into a work. But at the same time, you, you notice the limitation of it because even when you have an emotional outburst, you, you really just rebel and just pour your, you know, transform, uh, you know, basically put the suffering visually there, there seems to, especially from the gashes, there, there seems to be still something not yet healed because it seems like the wound are still, uh, you know, have blood and pain floating out. So it seems that it's still a process. I don't think you reach to a point that um, you are um, at a comfortable stage with what you're going through. So, um, I, I do want to know, like, uh, after creating this work, um, is there any changes in terms of uh, your relationship with this suffering, or you know, uh, what are what are the differences? And after perform, you know, kind of performing this kind of violent act during installation, is there anything that you would like to share? I I do not think that my artworks are. A narrative of my personal stories, mm. but uh, I think it 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 must have some relations to 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 myself, of course. But I'm thinking of a more more general approach mm. to to pay empathy and a compassion to all people. That if if there is um, any chance that we are sharing this together, mm. sharing the similar similar feelings and together. And that I think um, what I've been seeing from my own art is that, and, and thinking of it recently is that um, the concept of transferred suffering, it is like when, when you do not know how to, how to release your feelings so you turn violence. And when you've been, been, been hurted a lot, you try to hurt something else. It is, it is a, a gesture of helplessness. Mm. You, I think, yeah, I, I think um, when usually our way to process 
suffering is to act out, right? We, when, when we experienced trauma, when we experienced uh, injury that is caused by um, an external factor, usually we respond with an action to fight back or to create, to, to you know, continue the vicious cycle of violence, right? So, so then it just doesn't end and, uh, you know, it, it actually accumulates more hatred. And yes. um, so, so you, it, it, it's quite interesting because I think the first impression when I saw your work is that I can definitely feel the violence of it. But now you talk about that you actually want to, uh, you know, see this kind of a set of installation as an approach towards compassion and forgiveness. I think that's an interesting point because um, I, I, I think, especially if we connect that kind of idea of compassion to your imagery of a rising giant from the sea, I think this is an act of forgiveness for the, of the giant. Because I think when I, when I interpret it is the giant can always you know, succumb to an abyss of hurt and violence and he or she can just stay in the water for water of hatred as long as he or she likes. But when he is rising from the sea, it's almost there is a sense of liberation or emancipation from all of this violence that maybe he's very willingly to indulge in. And I think if, if we apply that kind of interpretation to the uh, sculptures and uh, the, the gashes on the wall, it seems like it, it's a, it is an attempt to for liberation for for audiences when when audience see the work and to relate it with themselves and this it's kind of like a process of healing from facing the violence almost so it's not trying to avoid it's not to avoid the pain is to but at the same time not to it's not to like just confront it it's a way of you know having a critical distance to perceive the pain, but at the same time, allowing yourself to forgive yourself. I think that's yeah. a very beautiful way to present, uh, you know, a very kind of like a dual idea, dualism of violence, pain and forgiveness. I think a lot of times, especially in the contemporary society, day, every day we're dealing with horrific issues you know now we have a war in ukraine and we you know it seems like every place in the world is in turmoil and it's very easy for each of us to just fall into the trap and become you know very nihilistic and uh, very pessimistic i believe but uh from the art of pain and art of violence once we understand the logic of it, and when we have the agency to stop the cycle, I think is the opportunity for us to learn how to heal and how to forgive, especially to forgive ourselves. So I think this is a, a very contemporary way to understand suffering, especially the use of the colors and the materials here is also very raw. And I, I, and I think there's such a beauty and aesthetic in it. So, uh, you know, although this session's uh, theme is uh, revolving around uh, nature and imagery, I think one of the key points that connect all of the artist's works is suffering and a, an attempt to process that emotion. Maybe Michelle's work is to use a very fragmented, fragmented postmodern approach to understand memories and the fragmented emotions and pain that's scattered around in our psyche. Maybe Adzi's work is definitely using, you know, animal as a subject to understand our, you know, human psyche and also our way to interpret the world outside of our own domain. And for Wing Z's work, it's, you know, as I mentioned just now, it's, it's, it's a interesting approach to understand uh, suffering so I think that's a you know and 
interestingly, your works are actually placing very close to each other in a show. <laughs> Although we uh, we have a you know our our floor plan in our spatial design this time is quite interesting. We 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 kind of really play with a lot of walls to create you know the separation. And it's almost kind of like walking into a maze, and the viewer needs to discover or needs to really walk around in the space to understand it works. But interestingly, you guys are, you know, kind of placed quite together. Um, so uh, amazing. So um, I would definitely like to see if um, any of our audience would like to ask the artist any questions. You can always leave your question in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and, you know, just go for it. Anyone would like to um, ask? Okay, so we have um, a Kit to uh, ask a question. So you all talked about your collaboration with non-human participants in your works. So he's wondering if the experience, interaction, or unexpected process of communication have been shaping and changing your art practice. I think um, this will be slightly more relevant to um, Nazi or Michelle's work. Maybe, maybe Michelle, you can add a little bit, especially from your research of Lo Tang. So um, how, you know, when, when you're doing understanding the, uh, the, the, the creature and also the symbolic meaning behind this being, um, how, how did it uh, influence you, uh, your, your, your current practice? Did, did you have a, you know, because you mentioned you usually, you know, create works that are already kind of, you know, using very mundane daily life objects or imageries to talk about uh, undescribable feelings. But after learning a little bit more of you know mythologies and fictional histories, do these kind of um, elements shape your uh, current practice or maybe the upcoming works are you making? Um, yeah, sure they did. Um, I think uh, uh, my interaction or uh, communication with the non-human participants are not limited to uh, uh, like uh, uh, the research that I did about uh, low tang people, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, I was very much influenced by the way um, by the way my dog and I uh, communicate or interact in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, normally I, uh, when I'm really bored or free, I like to observe him a lot. And, and that also led to my, my understanding about dogs as companion species and how they represent, uh, they could be a possible way to represent um, how, how human beings and other non-human beings could work out a uh, sustainable and like um, fairly just uh, relationship among each other. Um, mm. That also the, my after digging deep into such um, issues and concepts about um, companion species, I also learned about um, how to you know often lower or diminish our uh, human centric point of view in our mm. lives. And I think that is a very critical point to shape uh, that that have shaped my worldview and thus my works after. Mm. So awesome. So what about for you, uh, Adzi? Is there a similar kind of experience like Michelle, or you have something different? Uh, 
it's quite similar and I know that we also share the same experience working in the theme park. Mm. <laughs> and and after I doing the animal project, I uh this is the beginning or the first thing that I started to using video to uh as my art practice yeah. in the recent time. And because when when I need to observe some animals, I want to use a time-based material uh, medium to record and we can see how they their behavior or their emotional expressing in the video, not just in uh, images. So this is the changes that I started to take a lot of video. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's great that, you know, these kind of understanding with uh, non-human beings are able to kind of really um, allow you guys to have a deeper understanding and uh, exploration of issues of memory. So uh, again, thank you so much for you know, three of you guys to join us today for our last session of artist sharing. Um, we're, we'll pretty much open the show uh, in mid to late April so everyone can have a chance to see the sh exhibition before we close. And I uh, just want to do a slightly more promotion on our upcoming program. So we're going to have a series of uh, free um, studio visits with uh, Hong Kong artists who are currently residing in Canada. And uh, please stay tuned to our social media for upcoming uh, programs announcements. So uh, again, thank you so much for everyone to join us today. And uh, we wish you a great evening. So thank you again, uh, Michelle, uh, Nazi, and Wingsy. So uh, uh, see you guys soon. <laughs> thank so you. thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.